Hello and welcome back to the A Million Dollar Marathon podcast. We're going to spice things up a little bit today and do something a bit different. As you see, I'm joined by our very own Leo Worthington Lease, who is currently grinding some of the live games over in the US. So we're going to do a bit of a hand history review and uh, see if we can get some insight into the success behind Leo's US adventures. How are you doing, Leo? Where about you at the moment, mate? Pretty good. Pretty good. Thank you. Hello. I'm in uh, San Antonio now in Texas. I've been in Dallas for like a month and just come down here for a few days just to kind of mix it up a bit, you know, change the scenery, play some new games, um, play with some different people. But yeah, it's been good. I was in Vegas before that for a month and the, the games have just been really good because normally when you come to America, there's a lot of European grinders that kind of, you know, are free to travel around and they obviously know the games are pretty good. So they come over, but with the whole COVID thing, People have not really been traveling very much. So it's like a just complete free for all with, you know, fish shooting fish in a barrel, really. <laughs> uh, so how would you compare the games to in uh, Vegas to outside in, in Texas where you are at the moment? Um, a lot nittier in Vegas. People yeah. just and, uh, and also just a bit more low morale. You know, the games are a bit more boring, a bit more dull. People not really in, wanting to engage with each other very much. And and the, and the, I mean, while I was there, the plexiglass was up, too, as well. So there was like even more kind of divide between people. But the games here are much different. They're just they're just more action. People buying in for more money. People bring more reloads with them. People happier to lose. People happier to gamble. They want to play hands. You know, it's not like. Things aren't really getting close to the kind of solved pre-flop even or anywhere <laughs> close. Yeah. You know, whereas yeah. some some games in Vegas, you're like, oh, even this 50 year old guy knows he's supposed to, you know, free bet me here or whatever. Um, yeah, it's just not really happening. Here. It's completely random. <laughs> and obviously we've been seeing you a little bit on TCH Live. So with that. I've been on a couple of times. Are those games a fair representation of what's going on? Because I'm sure a lot of people watching them are thinking, well, I need to get the next flight over there if it's really like this every Yeah. Day. I mean, if you've been watching like the 25-50 game with Bildo when he was playing, uh, then that is actually a pretty fair representation, even of most of the 2-5 games. Like, it really yeah. doesn't change much. Uh, there's there's some games I've played have been like not really worth playing. I've played some like 5-10-20 that's been, a, that's been like relatively reg heavy and um i played it even a 2-5 game on the stream that was like everybody bought in for 5k and it was just like all of these regs that i'd never seen before came crawling out of the woodwork to play this game basically so that yeah. was not not amazing but other than that i mean the 2-5 the games really are like most people are sat with at least two thousand dollars nice. uh you don't really see anybody below a thousand dollars if you do it's like one person at the table and they've usually got like 700 800 and they feel they like are aware, aware that they're a short stack you know and there's often straddles that you can straddle up to 25 under the gun yeah. uh, there's bomb pots on dealer changes there's flips sometimes there's people doing red or black there's just all sorts of you can bring your own booze to the card house and leave it in the fridge and the waitresses will bring it to you oh wow so people okay. are just, yeah people are just having a great time it's really yeah. good Seems like they've got a bit of a better idea on how to kind of entice people to enjoy themselves a little bit more at the table. Because I think what you see in these kind of bog standard European casinos is, you know, a lot of people are, are there just to try and make money and there's not much of an atmosphere. And yeah, I, I like the sound of that over in Texas. It sounds like they've got... Right, a good, yeah. Yeah. It's much more of a like go out and play poker kind of experience. It's very... Uh, invitational to recreational players like there's there's a lot of recreational players they feel very welcome there aren't you know it's it, yeah it's not like playing anywhere else it's definitely different it's a real like card club social club kind of feel mm -hmm. more than anything else so it's so cool what games, what games have you got coming up this week uh there's a 10 25 game tonight which i'm trying to get on I'm, I'm like third on the list at the moment so i should hopefully get a seat at some some stage in the night um, and then I think there's a five ten game with a with a five dollar ante tomorrow, yeah. um, and then I'll just go back to Dallas. I'm going back to Dallas on Sunday night, or or Sunday at some stage. And then um, I got there was there's a guy uh, the guy that runs the stream in Dallas. He basically mentioned something to me the other day about they're doing like a, a Andrew Neem and Brad Owen vlog kind of session game in TCH in Dallas on Wednesday. And he asked me, like, if I was around, would he be able to put me in this high stakes game that they're doing for the for the kind of stream? So potentially I've got some kind of inroad there to nice. some potential free roll or something yep. of that nature. Which um, would be good. It's a good good scene to be exposed to as well. 
How high stakes are we talking? I'm not sure. I imagine it would be 10.25 or, or something yeah. like that. Maybe yeah. I don't know what they consider. I guess it would be 10.25. That would be my guess. <laughs> Good stuff. <laughs> In there as well, right? You're traveling around. You, you're trying to sort of keep up with the online grind. Um, you're a little bit tired. You just you just want to enjoy your life after a while. And it does feel like for the last year or so, which is when I've kind of transitioned more into playing online, not through my own choice, that um, it's just been poker, 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 poker. So um, mm. I've managed to take some time off and just do some sports betting, which is like a market that I think I'll always be able to have some decent edge in. Yeah, uh, it, well. yeah doing all right, to be fair. There's, it's just about it's just about being able to get on uh, with these softer bookmakers. I'm not going to go into which one. They are very quick to ban you because they know that they're exposed, but they're just making so much money on recreational punters that they don't they don't really like care about their their price offering. They just care about when they're getting smashed, you know. So it's been about two weeks, and what I need to look at, and uh, if I'm trying to get bets on in the future, is making sure that I'm not doing the pre-match stuff because obviously the bookmakers got longer to see the activity and that they can adjust from there. So. Uh, as a little bit of advice, as a side note to guys, if you are watching and you do like uh, dabble in sports betting, especially football, don't bother with the win draw win, the both teams to score, the under over goals markets, especially pre match. You know these mar these markets are driven out of Asia um, with you know near flawless um, perfection in terms of the actual uh, implied probabilities that they're giving, and as you as they are sort of like tailed down from Asia to Europe, and then to the local bookmaker that you'll be betting on, you're not going to be able to uh, to beat those odds in the long run, especially pre-match. You, you so. play like a very kind of similar to like an exploitative style of poker, don't you, when it comes to corners? You're like searching for the kind of rogue markets, last <laughs> minute action, very specific yeah. kind of bets, and it seems to be an absolute print. Exactly, yeah, in play especially, because, you know, when... When it's the punter versus the bookmaker in play and you're specialing on one market and they've got to offer every market under the sun. If you they've just, got to make a mistake. They've got to make mistakes, right? And if you know what to look for and if you've got the discipline, sometimes that's what I lacked at the start. You know, I just want to, oh, I've lost that one, but I knew that was a good bet. So I'm jumping on that one and then this one. That's where you're giving it away and that's where they make their money in the long run because there's a lot of people with those psychological um, flaws. But... As soon as you start to specialize in a market, you're, you've got like the, the stronger bookmakers up on the side so you can price uh, reference with them uh, just to make sure that your intuition's good. But if you focus on one market and you watch the way that the odds change with significant events in a game like a red card, um, a goal, um, uh, an injury, for example, those are the three main ones. You watch the way that the odds are changing on somewhere like Pinnacle or Marathon Bet and then you compare it to a bookmaker that you're using, um, you'll see that there are massive discrepancies in what's going on between the stronger bookmakers and the weaker ones, and you can exploit the weaker ones in that way. So, yeah, you are right. It is a pure form of exploitation, and it's something I quite enjoy because you know when you're playing poker, and this is something I, I'm really grateful about sports betting, when you're playing poker, you're thinking, learning, and playing all at the same time. But with sports betting, you're thinking... And then you place the bet, which is the only play. You actually just get to watch the match after that and try and learn yeah. that. You know, it, it's a little something bit... I want to start getting more into, I think. I mean, I've been, you know, I've been betting a bit on some other sports recently and like I've, I've been doing pretty well. But the problem is I've just got no volume and the bets, the, the sports that I'm like naturally interested in, there's just no volume for betting on something like yeah. Formula One. You know, you just would have to go mad at the weekend. But the bets I have taken have all been to me like, oh, this is a big edge, like because <laughs> It seems like they're not accounting for things that seem kind of obvious. You know, like the Monaco one was a was a fucking great example to me. Like giving such a good price on Verstappen to win when he's like starting second on the grid behind somebody that's crashed every time they've raced in Monaco, crashed after he set like pole qualifying lap, and and you know, and like a track where it's basically impossible to overtake, and the only person that's any faster than second position is starting like six places back on the grid. And then you can get like two to one on your money. I'm just like, okay, well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it, it was a silly price. And it, yeah, exactly. It was also because of the fact that they just hadn't factored in that Leclerc might have might have not even been able to start the race because yeah. 
Yeah, he shit housed his car like at the end of qualifying, which may or may not have been a tactical move. Let's not go into that. <laughs> say, I would say it would. I would say it wasn't. I I, I think it would be a, a a bad strategy if that was it, because you've got to just assume that you're going to get overtaken anyway. Like you've got to assume that Leclerc is not going to win that race, even if he starts on pole. So, but anyway, let's not get too much into the uh, like, yeah yeah. Let's let's do sport. the Formula One podcast another day. So. <laughs> Uh, we did promise some hand histories, and that's going to be the main point of this podcast. So, Leo, get, uh, take us away, mate. What's uh, what's the first right, one? I've got looking a couple at? of hands. Uh, so, the first one um, was one I think was pretty standard, but then after really dissecting it after I played it, I think I potentially could have done something differently. So, it was a uh, it was five ten. Um, I opened early position with King Tennis Spades to thirty. Uh, got four callers. Uh, I think there were. I think it was uh, hijack, cut off button, and then big blind. So I was out of position uh, yep. to, most, to most people. So $150 in the pot. It came ace, eight, eight, two spades. Yep. Ace, eight, eight, two spades. Um, check, check, and then the hijack, who's like a tight reg, like, and I mean pretty tight. Like, I, he's tight. He's, I really don't expect him to be getting out of line basically ever. I don't think he's really going to bet flush draws here very often. Mm-hmm. I think he's re- and I don't think he really has ace eggs. I think he almost exclusively has eight X when he bets the flop, effectively yeah. in the spot. Especially when I've got like king of spades. If I had like a worse flush draw, you know, I could potentially think he's betting some king high spades. But um, so he bets a hundred into into one fifty. Also, yeah. like very consistent with having AX. Um, the button calls and then I call. So we go three ways to the turn. There's 450 in the pot and then the turn to 10, which is obviously a great turn because like, uh, th- there was one combo of 10, eight suited because of the suit of the 10 on the turn. Yeah. Um, so it just makes it like extremely, extremely good for us. Cause it's like his only full house really. I don't know. I don't expect him to bet ace eight suited on the flop. And I don't think he'll necessarily always have it pre-flop either because he's just kind of like MP versus, early position and I consider him to be quite tight so I think he was he would be like three bet or fold a hand like ace eight I think his range is a lot more like seven eight eight nine uh yeah. and eight suited kind of hands maybe some random like eight no probably that probably seven eight eight nine maybe ten eight uh suited uh and then pocket eights obviously uh so ten yeah really good card gives us a pair we can obviously like get there against the n8 in another way now as well as just making a flush um also gives us like some potential for bluffing later in the hand i think we can still have pocket tens uh actually uh, maybe not maybe we don't still have pocket tens once he bets a hundred like two thirds and the button calls yeah, I he think goes two thirds better. and gets a call so with tens yeah. you've basically got two outs right yeah, one even with the ten of you're spades gonna, it's like we're not loving it so probably just folding here so and you're gonna uh, back up like betting frequency on the turn right so you don't really want to peel two thirds for one street with tens there yeah so no yeah, tens. So, so no tens for us, but we can still have aces. We can have ace eight ourselves. We can have eight X as well. I wouldn't check raise all of my eight X on the flop. Um, so turns a ten, checks to him. He bets two fifty again into four fifty. Still mm-hmm. getting a pretty good price. Still pretty happy again with our equity against his his range. And I feel like his range is very defined as well. So like we don't get really into too much trouble. Uh, and the button folds as well, which is nice. Uh, we call, so there's now nine. There's ever, uh, sorry, do you think there's ever a queen jack of spades in there? Uh, it's potential, yeah. It's one potential, combo, so. right? But, like yeah. One or two combos, yeah. Um, based on uh, implied odds and direct odds at that point of the hand. Yeah, pretty much. I think yeah. that he's. I'm going to be able to... Um, I think he's going to value bet an eight even when the flush completes a lot of the time because I'm going to have so much ASEX in my range that he can't just he can't just check back an eight on the river. So yeah. I think uh, we have a lot of implied odds, and he's also going to be in a very difficult situation facing like check raise on the river because he's going to know that I I'm capable of turning some hands into a bluff. I think he thinks that I'm quite aggressive as well. Yeah. Um, so there's nine fifty in the pot, and then the river is a two of spades, so I make the nut flush. Yeah. Uh, I check. He bets 725. And now this is where I think I should start realizing uh, that I potentially should just end up calling the river. Um, because when he bets 725 into 950, like I'm expecting his 8x to value bet the river, but I'm not really expecting it to value bet for a big size. I'm expecting it to value bet for a size that ASEX is going to want to call. Because if I have called down with ASEX, the only bluffs I'm really going to be giving him are going to be flush draws. So when the flush completes, like he's going to want to bet small to get value from my ASEX, not big. But 
that being said, personally, I would have some big bets with some AX as well on the river because I know that that is how they're going to be thinking about it. So they're going to think, okay, well, he has to have a flush now or nothing. And would he necessarily two thirds of flush draw into multiple people on the flop, etc. There's obviously a few levels to it. But I think when he bets the big size, I should be really suspicious. And I was, I took a long time before I made my decision on the river, but I just couldn't find enough hands to be worried about that warranted me to not raise in this spot. Like I thought he has to have some flushes sometimes and he's still going to have some AX sometimes. Perhaps he just has like eight, nine and decides that he wants to go big size and then be comfortable folding. Or he thinks that I'm going to station him down when I have like ace king with a spade or ace queen with a spade or whatever. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, what, what what do you feel like doing on the river? Um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's, for me, it feels like a raise. Um, I'm struggling to find full house combos he can actually have. What is it? Right. Two combos? Two combos of ace eight suited? Eight and like. Combos. And then 10 8 suited uh, is like two as well or one? 10 8 suited, I, th- I think was possibly, it was it was one, but actually yeah. it was possibly zero because it, it would be one or zero. I'm sorry, yeah. I don't know. It would definitely be one or zero. And I don't think I'm going to really give him that pre flop. So I'm, I just would say it's basically zero. Like I don't think he's going to have. Okay, so he's, he's probably not going to have that. He's, he's probably not going to flat King 8 suited in that spot, is the only issue, which I think would be the, clear, the clearest 8 x value bet. And like a lot of these guys, I think if he's tight, he considers you to be aggressive so that you could have like ace with a spade that you're going to check raise. And he doesn't want to be there with eight, seven suited being like just in the bin for like a, a 2K check raise or something. So, yeah, I think that this bet is like super polarizing in a way that what's his value and what are his bluffs? Like that, that those right. are the really, those are the really interesting spots, I think, because yeah. I'm um, working what do you out have here. <laughs> what the hell does he have? Right. Is it, and then what I'm starting to think is, does he have pocket eights? That would be the only hand that makes sense, in my opinion. Want to bet two thirds on the flop with pocket eights? Yeah, that's that's also yeah. But like, what what else can he have on the river if it's ace eight suited, pocket eights, and he's not going to bet big on the flop with ace eight or pocket eights? No, you don't, because you're just blocking too much of the board, right? Both of them are just like either checks or small bets. And I think small bets are okay in these lineups because people are just going to never fold an ace and you want, you know, to keep them in and keep their flush draws in, you know, keep bloody gut shot Gary in with four, three of spades or something, you know. Yeah. Like. like if you start sizing up the flop with ace eight suited, you risk somebody folding something like five, six of spades. Yeah, yeah. Because they realize that it's a multi-way part. Other people are going to have draws that dominate them. And, you know, like when they make their hand, they're unlikely to get paid because it's going to be kind of obvious and their pairs are no good or whatever. So I, I think this that runs, he runs a real risk of like uh, of people folding the flop when he bets big size. So, yeah, that's that's basically the exact conclusion I reached. It's like I have no idea what you are even supposed to have here. Like it doesn't make any sense to bet big on the flop with your value yeah. to me. And then because the run out doesn't give you any full houses, that to me is like, OK, I just have to raise and... Yeah. Having said Shoot, that, though, yeah, though, having said that though, when it's one of those spots where you don't know what their value is and what their bluffs are, and you've got him as like a, a profile of a pretty tight player that might be a, a little bit scared of you, or let's not say scared, but let's say apprehensive as to your um, aggression. So, in those situations, do you really think? He's gonna. He's just gonna start blasting off seven two five. And if it is just some, what, has, what if his range is exactly like a queen jack of spades, eight x queen nine of spades, queen jack of spades, and then eight x. Yeah. And then we just pull out the full houses because he big bet the flop. That's which is what I did in game. I was, I was, just like, dis- okay, I, was discount- I was discounting the queen nine because of what you said his like. Yeah, I I am also discounting it. It's very reachy. Yeah. Um, this is really the only one. Mm. It does exist, and if it, it, if, exist. That, if we're sure that that exists, I would yeah. not sure that, that exists. That's the problem. I'm not, not sure, sure that, that exists. exists. Yeah, uh, I ended up making it twenty two hundred after thinking about it for a long time. I I I basically decided to call, yeah. and then I could picture Jack. I could picture myself yeah. <laughs> telling Jack this hand, and him <laughs> going, "Why the fuck didn't you raise the river?" Yeah. But yeah, then yeah. I was like, "Okay, well, I, like I have to. I have to." And I told him and afterwards, and he was like, yeah, I feel like we have to raise. Yeah. Yeah. I made I a mean, 20 on the river, and he called. Oh, so we win. We'll leave it there. We'll leave it there, and we'll go on to the next step. Uh, <laughs> <laughs>
How can we lose? Has he just like decided to blast deuces in position two street? Uh, he had ace eight. He had ace eight suited. No. And he gave me like the five minute tank call on the river as well. Oh. And I like, slammed my hand down like an absolute genius. <laughs> You're like, come on, oh, baby. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, oh, did he uh did he complete the nit roll with the brilliant oh aces then, is it? No, he didn't say anything. To be fair, I'll give him that one at least. Yeah. So yeah, that was one. That was a that was an interesting one. Very kind of tricky hand. I struggled with that one a little bit. Yeah. Uh, bad that um, it was. Everybody I've spoken to has really kind of struggled with it a bit as well. So. Yeah, I like those ones because, like as we said earlier, uh, not sure what the value is or what the bluffs are. Um, with the player profile, not likely to have some bluffs, but there is a chance that he's just bet a few of his a few too many flush draws on the flop and got you know arrived there with like seven six of spades when he shouldn't really bet that multi-way there are chances right and i think yeah. that the raise in hindsight is uh is merited for that um mm. so that's that's where i'm at with that one um yeah i feel the same on to hand number two unlucky sir well played <laughs> So, yeah, hand number two. Uh, so, hand number two was against a guy who I had not played with that much, but I'd been paying attention to him because he looked kind of young and reggy, and I'd noticed that just on boards that favoured the big blind range when he defended, he was very aggressively check-raising, basically. Like, I'd seen him go to, like, four flops where it was, like, a 9-7-6 or, you know, like, a 7-5-4, 7-5-3, and he was just check-raising every single time. Okay. Um, He's got three moves. He's got a few moves, but they're a little bit plain. Okay, uh, yeah. So I opened, this is 2-5. We were, we were relatively deep, but it doesn't, doesn't matter too much. Um, yep. I opened a set of diamonds under the gun to 20, and he defends the big blind. And it comes 8-6-3 with one diamond, rainbow with one diamond, which is like just the absolute dream versus this guy, basically. Yeah. It's like, if I, I, this is the flop I would choose against him. I think um, we could, like, this is going to be a big bet board, obviously, right? And, like, I, I guess we get do get to overbet these kind of textures sometimes. We do. We definitely do. I could do, you could do, like, a real mixture of things here, I think. But I think against this guy with my reads, I want to induce, I don't want to bet big and him just go, okay, well, I just won't check raise him now because he's bet a big size, so I'm just going to give up and fold. So I, I bet 15 into 40. Um, I wouldn't really go any smaller than that. I mean, you know, like 13, if I could go 13 in the on online world, but whatever. Yep. Um, so, yeah, make it 15, then he check raises to uh, 90. 90? Like, 90. Big yeah. one. Yeah. 90 or 85, something like that. Um, My issue with his yeah. size is here, you've, uh, you've opened 4x under the gun, right? And he's defended the big blind. It's heads up, right? Yep. So where's his... Eight three six three. Yeah. Suited. He should fold eight three suited. I think so I, it's I gonna be very six cool three heavy. suited would be a fold, wouldn't it? In four versus the folding. No, I just I would just give him uh, sixes threes and eight six suited there, but that might be a little tight. Maybe the six three creeps in. I would just fold that in game versus the reg four x yeah. under the gun. Just get to the next hand, but. It depends on the player. They'd have to be good for me to not defend. And even then, I think it's like, you know, I, I, I'm aware that it's probably uh, not on the chart, but also these games are hourly. You pay yeah. $11 an hour, and okay. then it's rate free. It's yeah. rate free. So the ranges are a, a lot wider, or like a decent bit wider, especially when it comes to defending and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, personally, I would defend 6-3 suited in this spot, and I think most of the players are, are defending 6-3 suited. Whether or not we're all making money do it, doing it. It's like a different story, obviously. So it's like, you know. So you've got to really back your post flop abilities. So, but again, um, this check raise does seem like BS. And I guess you're kind of tempted to three bet for value. But at the same time, if you think that his range is just so full of shit, yeah. you don't mind giving him a, a free card with his gut shots. Or he could even have like a complete no equity blast here, right? Like, uh, a Jack Seven suited or something like that with a back door, you exactly. know. <laughs> exactly. We crush we crush some of the back doors as well, which is nice. Like having the back door flush draw is just really sick. Uh, I think he's still going to bluff quite a lot on an ace as well because if he's reading, if he's doing any kind of hand reading, he should realise that we're we're going to be floating a lot of like over pairs. 
and like hands that kind of connected with the board. Also a lot of like ten nines ten and nine. some like Broadway Broadway back doors, Jack ten suited kind of stuff. So he should should understand that an ace is a pretty irrelevant card if it does hit. Yeah. Um, so what do you think his um uh do you think he's gonna raise a king eight suited here or a queen eight suited? Potentially. I think it's probably not for this size though. No, neither. I'd be, I'd be quite shocked if this is like one pair value. Um, I think for me, his range is wide. I'm giving this guy like all the kind of nine, seven, ten, nine, seven, five, five, four, and then a load of like other stuff, which I don't have to define at the moment, but I know exists. Do you know what yep. I mean? Like, I know there are bluffs here. Yeah. I don't have to know exactly what they are at the moment. Um, I just know that I have the nuts. Uh, like having ace eight here is just so much better than even having kings like yeah. actually blocking so much of the value that he's repping is just absolutely unreal which obviously leads to like uh, some stuff later in the hand um yeah. so we call there's a i think there was about 220 in the pot uh turns the nine of diamonds so okay. it's like not an amazing card he's obviously gonna have he's gonna connect with it with his pairs sometimes like the the hands that were check raising uh the flop like nine seven ten nine uh those kind of things makes the nuts yeah and seven five makes the nuts obviously and ten seven makes ten seven makes a straight and seven five makes straight yeah both the nuts um and then he bets 275 yeah which i can now just rule out like nine x individual yeah. because if he has turned something like nine seven or, or uh nine ten I really don't think he's going to be overbetting the turn with a hand like that. So I and now I'm like happy to rule out a hand that is just bare nine x. So we're still focusing on his like flop value hands. I don't think the nine's going to improve him to two pair ever. Um, so he really has only improved to a straight on the turn. So his combos now that he's repping are threes, sixes, eight six, and ten seven and seven five. Obviously yeah. we block eight six. Uh, we block eight six. We block pocket eights, which is great. Um, and the uh, yeah, so he bets he bets over bet on the turn about 130 percent pot. We call obviously we have the nut flush draw as well, so it's like a really kind of great card. It allows yeah. us to just hero call more easily uh, in a spot where we kind of already assume that we're winning. So there's now 750 in the pot. Uh, the t the rivers are offsuit five, so it completes any seven x. But I don't give him any seven x that wasn't already a straight on the turn. Like yeah. as I said already, like nine seven. Uh, I'm ruling out seven, uh, seven, eight. I'm ruling out six, seven. I'm ruling out because he wouldn't check raise the flop. Big. He wouldn't bomb the turn. Um, so his his straight combos remain the same. And if anything, the five is actually a good card because it now just reduces the combos of seven, five. And I also think if he had ten, seven specifically, he would go huge on the river because like yeah. I could still have some seven X. I can have seven, eight, six, seven pocket sevens. You know, I can have like nine, ten. That's a really good hero call. I'm going to have a very strong range here. I'm going to have sets. I'm going to have over pairs. So when he if he does have a straight on the river, he's, I think, still incentivized to go pretty big. Yeah. So the 750 in the pot, he bets 485 on the river. And so, if, yeah, four, four cards straight, flush backdoor, flush draw, bricked. And I ended up calling for those reasons. Yeah, and yeah, the only one I was thinking that you didn't mention there was 7-4 suited, but that would... Yeah, yeah. potentially, that's it. That's, that that's yeah, that's a front door gut shot. Getting right. only a few combos. Yeah, front door gut shot, yeah. uh, only a few combos. Definitely possible, but I also think his straights are just going to be sizing up a bit more on the river in general. I think um, he's, he's a lot of stuff like Jack Ten backdoor here for this like bomb on the turn. Yeah, turned good equity. Yeah, um, I think his I think his uh, sets. He's kind of repping a set now. Like he's yeah, kind yeah, of repping yeah. a set only now on the river. He's not really repping a straight anymore. On the turn, he was trying to rep a straight or a set. Now he's just kind of repping a set, but we block top set. And, it, and like, just given with the tendencies, like, I don't know if a set's going to want to race huge on 863 Rainbow. I don't know no. if he's going to wa want to start overbetting. Like, yeah, it's just, it's just a lot. There's a lot of stuff that goes into this. So I ended up calling, like, I didn't really take too long about it. I kind of decided, like, on the turn that he's mm -hmm. basically just full of shit and I've got a great hand to call down with. So I'm going to call whatever the river is. And because any straight completing river is really good. Like, a 10 is maybe kind of bad, but that's about I it. Think, I think a 10 is worth much worse. Spot. These are the rare spots on the straight completing rivers when um, someone is check raising a board that they perceive to be better for them, but really isn't like 
it's just yeah. not it's not, not a big blind advantage board you know it's too gappy and there's you know there, there's very few offsuit two pairs which is kind of where the advantage comes in a lot of the time so well, I, I think I, yeah when people kind of like start check raising and like ar arrive at a river like this I think they tend to over bluff actually because they're like oh well it's a four straight there he's opened under the gun he's got all the high cards let's go for another one shall we that's what I was going to say is I think there's one of the biggest, uh, where I think a lot of my winnings come from in live cash is people getting themselves into these situations where they can't even keep up with themselves. You know, yeah. they, they, start, they start off on the flop with a, a reasonable idea mm -hmm. and then it just kind of spirals out of control because they're not really hand reading. It gets to the turn and they're only focusing on, is that good for me? Can I win this pot if I just bet, bet, bet? And they're not, they're really not thinking about how their range actually wants to play on yeah. turns and what they're even representing and, you know, how they're going to, how this river is going to change things. Am I going to have any 7x? Because actually, yeah, I'm going to have like a decent amount and I'm going to have a bunch of bluffs as well. Like if you just have the, have a strong hand, like a set's just such a great check call because yeah. you want to neutralize my bluffs somehow. If yeah. otherwise, if you just check the river, then I always win. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have some hands you want to check the river with. 8-6, you don't even want to bet for value anymore. Uh, eight, you know, six, it's like the window for sure in this line. There's no val there's no uh betting. No two pair value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no so two pair value. It's get, they're getting lost in, in their own thoughts, you know. They're trying 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 too hard to implement a strategy that they kind of feel like is the right thing to do, but they haven't done any work on it and they don't really know how to implement it at all. They've just kind of seen other people being aggressive and thought, well, I need to check raise the flop sometimes without yeah. realizing the flop leads to the turn in the river. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, especially versus a, a, a competent opponent, you are not going to get that many flop folds compared to a lot of the guys that you're up against in this spot that just start folding like loads of their backdoor hands and like any basically non paired hand that just goes in the muck. But versus a seasoned opponent that can actually uh, read hands well, you've got to be careful in these spots because you are going to see turns and rivers a lot. And if you're not comfortable putting in uh, bets or understanding where you are in your range or you know what you're representing like you said I think that was the most important point the what you're representing part right because it's changing in every street in this hand and you've correctly yeah. deduced that yeah I, I mentioned I posted this hand on my Instagram story when it like when it happened and I did mention at the bottom I gave kind of like my kind of summary of advice I guess for these spots is like when you're facing aggression on boards where somebody's trying to represent the nuts on every street, even though every street changed the hand, yeah. it's really often going to be a bluff. It's just going to be somebody realizing that that's quite a good board for me, so I can just bet loads and hopefully he folds by the river. And that's really as far as their thought process goes. So yeah, I think in, the, in these spots, I made a lot of like thin cooldowns in the past in spots like this, so, you know, like one pair on four straight or one pair on four flush boards, because generally when people want to bluff, they start using big sizes because they want you to fold and they're going to be like aggressive with their bluffs. They're not going to be sneaky with their bluffs and like float you to bluff later. Or no, 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 never happens. Yeah. Their bluffs straight up. I'm going to punch you in the face and hope that you go down. You know, those are the bluffs. So when people start piling in money, when most people are not even confident piling in money with like really strong hands that aren't the nuts, like a yeah. lot of people get this, get uncomfortable piling in top money on with top pair on a dry board over more than two streets you know so when they start piling in money on these tricky boards where you know it doesn't really favor you and you're very suspicious that your range is kind of capped and you think he's got an understanding and you've seen him do something before like you just got to put your money in yeah, Don't yeah. Be afraid you're making a bad decision you know sometimes you just got to pay the man you know pay the man and and those things can can reap good rewards like you can make a lot of money bluff catching people always say people never bluff live but that's because they're looking for bluffs in spots where they're expecting people to be doing good bluffs. You know, they're like, oh, well, I called the river when he triple barreled in a free bet pot because he can have bluffs here. That's not where he's going to have bluffs because he can also have good hands there. So he's just going to bet you bet with the good hands. Yeah. You've got to look for bluffs in unconventional spots where things don't really make sense. And, you know, things aren't kind of adding up. Something, something's not quite right, but you can't place your finger on it. I think, but, but, but when people can't quite place their finger on it, they're more likely to shy away a bit and go, oh, well, I'll just give them the benefit of the doubt because I don't think people really bluff. You know, yeah. people are out there bluffing in every game I've ever played, even old guys, even middle aged guys. Even, you know, whatever nationality you think never bluffs, whatever. They're all out there bluffing. You just got to really, like, pay attention and find when they're going to be bluffing. Yeah, I completely yeah. Usually, agree. The, the thing is about when you're playing against bad players. I, I had this conversation with Sven recently when we were in Vegas. 
the thing about bad players is they're bad players. So when a bad player puts you in a tough spot, chances are he just has a good hand because yeah. a bad player is not competent enough to think up a good spot to put you in a bad spot. They don't mm-hmm. they don't go through the hand logically and think, oh, this will put him in a really tough spot. They're not even yeah. thinking about that. If somebody puts you in a tough spot and you're like, oh, I've got a, I'm indifferent with this kind of weak call, then those are the times you should be folding and not bluff catching. Yeah. The times you should be bluff catching is when you know people are are trying so hard to represent the nuts that you're suspicious of it. You know? Yeah. yeah. If, if, yeah. if a bad player also, needs to be doing good bluff, it's probably not happening. Also, when that part of and I think that this is maybe for more experienced players like you or myself. You know, there is a part of your intuition that just there is something off, you know, uh, and I, I get that feeling. And I've made some big li- uh, uh, live laydowns and I've been shown uh, or because I'm quite a loud presence at the table. People like showing me bluffs, right, because it's like fun and it's like a bit of banter. But I've always noticed whenever I was going through the hand and like electing to side fold that there was a, like a just I'm something. Thinking- so- Something I don't get in other spots, you know? Something's just like, this doesn't make sense. This doesn't make yeah. sense. What the hell's going on? Oh, be people... true to yourself to, fo- to trust those reads, though. That's part, yeah, of, exactly. part of, like, crushing poker consistently is you really need to, like, be confident with those reads and not be afraid of being wrong and not be afraid of calling 2K on the river and going, oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, sometimes think, you're going to make a bad decision, of course. I think it was a byproduct of being underrolled for the games and being a little bit inexperienced. And, and also that horrible thing, which is what a lot of people are saying, is that no one ever bluffs, no one ever bluffs, no one ever bluffs, like you say. Yeah, they do. You, you just need to, you know, you, you don't get to just sit there and be like, no one ever bluffs fold. You know, like if, yeah. if you're doing that, you're the one getting exploited by the bad player because they're going to realize somewhere in their subconscious mind, this guy's a bit money scared. I'm just going to put him in spots and they're not really going to know what to do. They're just going to start like this guy blasting chips into the pot. Exactly. Uh, they, that's where it comes from. You can never tell h- how frustrated somebody is about playing with you or games they've played earlier in the day, how much money they're down today, yeah. this week, this month, this year, in their lifetime, like whatever. You, you can never tell. A lot of people will look really, really calm and steady at the table, but deep down, the, <laughs> their fucking fires are burning in there, man. Yeah, I've had these kind of conversations with people and they were just like, well, you were just talking nonstop, so I had to, I had to stick it on you or something. something. Yeah, yeah. You have to be very aware of, of what people are going to think of you as well, because I think in general, people are quite um, disagreeable internally. You know, they look at people and they're like, oh, fuck that guy. Mostly, I think yeah. people, especially someone like you or I, you know, like, yeah. oh, a foreign guy as well, an English guy over here playing my games in Texas. Like, yeah. fuck that guy, you know, yeah. and, and I... I'm sure there have been many. I mean, there's a one guy in particular who seems to be going out of his way to just give me his money. Like, he's so <laughs> aggressive against me. In all these... I can tell you a couple more hand issues from him if you want. Those are ones where I'm just like, you're definitely bluffing both times. Like, you're, you're, you're completely 100% sure that you're bluffing. And he's been bluffing both times and he's just completely blasted it off. But um, some people are out there and they just they just see you one day and you don't even know. You don't even know this person. You've never yeah, even yeah. made it from them. But they like, see you and they've got yeah. fuck off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is that is the thing. And I think it, we do stand out like a, a prick at a wedding, really, don't we? <laughs> so, yeah. yeah we... Thing. So um, let's try and round it off there. What what did he actually have in the end? Did he did you ask in the ace, him? Uh, ace eight of diamonds and he had queen four of diamonds. So he just check raised a complete air ball on the flop yeah. with very tenuous back doors. And then we turned eight, the dominating. Eight, eight. Yeah, so he did I, I wasn't far off with the Jack Seven backdoor one. Oh you weren't uh, yeah. <laughs> backdoor gutter <laughs> over card, you know. Quite. Uh, how 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 much did he have behind? Um Do you more okay? Had, what, 485 on the river and he probably had about 800 behind or something. Yeah, Yeah, it could have been nice. But never mind. Um, So, guys, let us know in the comments if you do like this feature. Uh, We're going to try and make the videos, you know, a bit more short and snappier and uh, full of uh, interesting stuff going on as we're, like, travelling around. We do uh, always rambling. (laughs) Yeah, we do always rambling. I think there's going to be a bit of editing in this one. but. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it, guys, and uh, catch us next time on the Million Dollar Marathon podcast. Thanks very much for joining. See you later. Bye-bye.